Hi again, everybody. Great to see you um, and welcome to this part of our service where we just climb into some of the teaching that we're going through this month. Um, and I'm hoping that you're kind of catching the flow, but we've got this uh, title series called Gateway Values. We're really talking about what is making us distinct as a local church. Last week, I talked about uh, that first part of our strap line uh, where Jesus is encountered. And uh, I just want to just quickly recap just to say that it is so important for me, for us as a leadership team, for us as a church, that uh, we place Jesus in the preeminent role of anything we declare over our church. We're never going to shy away from that or back away from that. Jesus is absolutely crucial to our faith. Uh, not in the sense that, you know, our faith is some kind of Premier League super champion against other faiths. That's the, not why we're saying that. It's just that we genuinely believe that Jesus is the answer to the cancer of sin that affects our world. And we, he just wants to rescue people and help them. So Jesus is encountered and we want people to encounter Jesus as part of our community. And this week... I really want to look at the second part of that little purpose statement, which says uh, people are valued. People are valued. There's uh, some verses in Luke chapter 2 that will come up, or somebody will come up on the screen in just a moment. Um, I, I just want to read just the context for you. It says this, Jesus went up onto a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. And at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them. To be apostles. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the sea coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And they had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by evil spirits were healed and everyone tried to touch him because healing power went out from him and he healed everyone. That is a picture of what I believe the church should be like. The thing is that we live in a 21st century cynical world and when it comes to the church, the church is really struggling with some bad press because of some of the bad avenues, the bad stances it's taken in the past. There's a lot of anti-church feeling out there, particularly in the societies that we find ourselves amongst. The way the church treated Jewish people, the way the church has handled, not handled well, the issue of racism. And you'll know we've tried to address, at least start to address some of that as a local church there in recent months. How it has handled uh, the issue of people with same-sex attraction, how it has handled the equality of women, how it has treated its children, how it has kept silent on important issues and compromised on other areas or been judgmental to others. It's made some bad mistakes. Is it any wonder that there is a degree of cynicism that exists in our world when it comes to churches and it's relevant or it's important a million miles from the person of Jesus. And of course then, for many, uh, I'm sure many will understand what I'm talking about here, local churches often are having to deal with the problem of backbiting, backstabbing, gossiping, prejudices, which seem to trouble so many local churches internally. Of course, that's a real deal because um, the Bible tells us when we're, to, when we're persecuted, when we're despitefully used, it says that we're to turn the other cheek and that's how we're meant to respond. And I, I just think there are many punch drunk Christians that exist in our churches from having to turn the other cheek from bad things that have been said about them or done to them by other Christians when in fact we should all be united and dealing with the real issues of our world and turning our other cheek out in the world, not inside the church. Tony Campalo, some of you may have heard of him, he's a great apologist, uh, pastor, teacher, 
Remember him uh, telling a story some years ago where he was invited onto a chat show just to really talk about and defend the Christian faith. And he was a little bit uh, ambushed when he got onto the show because he hadn't realized But when he sat down, another guest that's been invited to that show was a leading light in the atheist movement in the United States. And really they'd set him up to have a, a, a conversation on the TV uh, about the pluses and minuses of church. And he remembers the lady at some point in the interview uh, talk, uh, turning to him and really uh, quite forcefully saying, I would never, I would never be a part of the Christian church. And when he challenged her and said, well, why is that? And she said, because the Christian church is the only army in the world that shoots its own wounded. What a statement. He was stunned to hear such a thing. Now, I know I'm being negative here, but, uh, and actually, if we do a proper study of the impact, the positive impact of church in society, you see it's had incredible, incredibly positive impacts in the lives of countless millions of people in many societies. But nevertheless, that idea is a populist view of church today. One that we, as the people of God, have to handle and deal with. And it's why we are enshrining this idea that as a local church at Emmanuel, we want to value people just for who they are. Not by judging, not by compartmentalizing, but just valuing people. It's a powerful thing to do. Some of you may have heard of George Verwa. I've got to get that right. George Verwa. Actually, George uh, hails from the US, but he actually lives not far from us here over in Bromley. George is the founder of a missions organization called Operation Mobilization. He's a pretty strong, outspoken advocate uh, for the gospel and actually does provoke the church. And um, I remember uh, reading a quote of his where he rewrote some of the verses, actually all of the verses of that famous hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. This is what he read. I'll read you just uh, one of his verses uh, that he said. Like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've often trod. We are much divided, many bodies we, having different doctrines, but not much charity. Oh gosh, I just was so challenged when I read um, some of those words. Jesus, by contrast, was not a bit like that. Actually, he was a baffling, non-religious, religious person. He didn't gravitate towards the religious people of the day. You would think as the son of God coming to the earth that perhaps that's where he would go. No, that's not where he went. He didn't pursue them. It seemed actually when you study the life of Jesus and look at those verses in Luke that I read earlier on, that, that people who were nothing like Jesus wanted the most to be around him. They liked him the most. Whenever Jesus showed up, a crowd would always gather around him, wanting to be with him. Just pause for a moment. There was no Twitter feed that he could tap into to just explain where he's going to be at a certain time. No Facebook advertising that can say, come and join me at this Facebook party. There was no kind of advertising. People just seemed to find out because they were compelled to be with this man to be near this man. The crowd were motivated to be near him because they liked him, and here's the deal, and he liked them back. They didn't feel judged or accused. They just wanted to be in his presence. Jesus says as he's returning back to heaven that the church is meant to be his body. You and I, if we we're part of this local church, we're called to be the representatives of the body of Jesus on earth. So what is true of Jesus personally should be true of all of us collectively. We want to be resisting the things that make the church so resistible to society. I wonder if you remember the, little sto the story of the three little pigs. You know the story, they, they, they were, uh, uh, had run out and uh, were trying to sort of escape 
the big bad wolf and the first little pig built his house of straw, the second one built his house of wood and the wolf came along, he was huff and he puff and he blew their house down and he came to the, the third house and that little pig had built his house of bricks and no matter how hard the wolf tried, he couldn't blow the house down. Why? Because that little piggy had built his house out of the right stuff. And part of what we're trying to talk about over these next few weeks in terms of our values and our purpose statement is we want to build out of the right stuff our values, the anchor of the person of Jesus and his word and the expression of our love for a world that God loves so much. The early Christians were described as having an uncommon fellowship and it included such an incredible diverse group of people. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come upon him, it says, it describes all the different Jews from all parts of the region uh, in the area, different countries, different provinces, just a variety of people that spoke many different languages, and yet when he talked about Jesus, 3,000 men plus others were convicted and joined and became what was the fledgling church that we know as today. In Acts chapter 2, at the end of that passage, that church is being established and the writer of Acts is commenting on what that community, that new community of people looks like. And he says some very powerful words. He says, everyone was filled with awe by what God was doing in their midst. They became so generous, there was no needy persons among them. And then they enjoyed the favour of all the people. What an incredible contrast that statement is. They enjoyed the favour of all the people. Actually, Eugene Peterson in the message translation translates that last phrase. He says, and the people liked what they saw. Compare that with the populist view of the church today. If I can speak to you as the church at Emmanuel, I believe we can change some of that populist view by the way that we treat people in our world, in our community, how we care, how we show love. That's our mission. I'll come to that a little bit later on. Actually, I came across this phrase, a uh, little sort of, uh, just going to, uh, this little statement here, A-T-J-D-N-W-H-I. Our congregation, our people that love Jesus should be like this, head turning, jaw dropping, never would have imagined that we would see those people to Together in association. Head turning, jaw dropping, never would have imagined we'd see that group of people in association. Folks, that is a powerful way to model the church. When people outside turn around and say, I would never have imagined that group to be so tightly knit, that diverse group of people. It speaks powerfully to our world. And of course, when Jesus was starting his church, he started with the disciples. And I was reading something when I was preparing this, and I actually want to quote this because it's way better than I could do. Uh, John Ortberg, uh, as a pastor in, in the States, um, over in uh, San Francisco, I think that's right, and um, he, um, um, he, he, he describes those disciples and what they were like, that little motley crew. And, his turn of phrase is very powerful. Let me just read you how he describes the disciples. He says they weren't exactly adding value to Jesus' ministry. I think that's probably an understatement. So be encouraged. If you feel you're struggling right now, if you don't think you're adding value to the mission of the church, well, look what Jesus started with. He says they didn't get his teaching. They argued all the time. Their number one debate was who's the greatest. Two of them asked if they could sit at his right hand when they got to heaven which got the other 10 really ticked off. They tried to keep children away from Jesus when Jesus wanted to see them. They promised to be with Jesus in his greatest trial. And then when that trial came, they all ran away. When Jesus said it was time to stay awake and pray in the garden, they all went to sleep. And when Jesus said it was, uh, and when Jesus said it was time to go to sleep in the boat, they woke him up and frightened and said they wanted him to pray. In Luke chapter 9, they went through a Samaritan town which they didn't feel there had been a sufficient welcome by the people there. And they asked Jesus, should we call fire down from heaven to kill all these Samaritans in love? 
Actually, I'm just adding that bit on the end. Um, just, just to see where those guys were at. And Jesus said, no. In Mark 9, they said, we saw a man who was casting out demons in your name, but it wasn't one of us, so we stopped him. Did we do good? Jesus said, no, he didn't. Thomas was a doubter. Judas was a thief. Levi was a tax collector. Peter cut off a guy's ear. And he goes on to say, so where did Jesus get these guys from? Disciples are us. It just made me smile on that turn of phrase. The only thing those guys had in common was Jesus. And somehow, love for him drew them together and transformed them. When Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, a little bit later on in the life of the early church, he says these words, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Paul's describing the people that he's writing to, that the church at Ephesus right now says, you were like that. But because of his great love for us, can you hear me? Are you hearing me? Are you paying attention right now? Not because of anything we've done, not because of anything they have done, but because of his great love for us. Because God valued you and me. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Look what God built with. He didn't build his church with clever, all together, all sorted people. He built it with sinners. People who are weak, who failed, who blew it, who kept on blowing it time and time again. You just read the story of the apostles trying to get it right even after the day of Pentecost. Paul says, we were dead in our sins. And transgressions. He's more strong than that. He says, We were objects of wrath by nature. God saved us not because we deserved to be saved or rescued as people, but because He loved us. And He still loves people. So when God built His church, He built it with people that society deemed as useless, broken rejects. Yet God built His church with people like us, people like you and me. The problem is in church that when saved sinners join the church, they do tend to bring a little bit of baggage with them. And actually, if you follow the accounts of Paul's letters, trying to handle some of the fallout of that, you begin to see that even after the point of commitment to Jesus, there were pretty major issues that faced the church. One of those things in those times was really, it was a race deal, a cultural deal, Jews and Gentiles. The whole gospel had gone past the Jewish faith and now Gentiles were being welcomed in, but they had very different cultures. And some of the things that the Gentiles did out of culture, the Jews could not get on with. And so it caused this friction in the church, and Paul had to address that in some of his letters. It didn't go down well with the Jewish believers at that time, and so he writes these words, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders, you were living apart from Christ, you didn't know the covenant promises that God had made, you lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus. He united Jew and Gentiles into one people. Are you hearing me? Because that's the power of this message. He, announced, he, he, he united Jew and Gentile into one people. The thing is, 
we always like to create an exclusive group because of our fallenness as human people. We talk about being in the in crowd, but because we're in the in crowd, there are people that are on the outside of that crowd. And our fallenness tends to perpetuate that idea. We're the exclusive group. We're the people that have found Jesus, and so those people out there, they're lost. We'll pray for them. Jesus says you can't behave like that. You need to love them and reach them. We tend to have this exclusive group. I remember what it's like when the guys were at school when I was much younger were picking up the football team and they had two captains and that this guy, you can come with me, you can come with me and I'm sat there so I hope I'm not the last person to be picked for this team because you realise you're kind of just on the outside of the good players. It's not a nice feeling. Let me just illustrate that a little bit more powerfully and pertinently for us at the moment. I don't know when the last time you took an international flight was. I think for many of us, that's going to be a long time ago right now. Mine would have been last year sometime at the earliest. Um, but I remember actually on one of those occasions sitting down in sort of the, the what seemed to be an okay area. Um, the chairs were quite close. And we, under, we understand that that was second class because, because at the front of the plane, there's business and first class. And you all know what happens when you, when you sit down, everyone's taking their seats and you're sat um, in the second class seating. Um, the attendants come through, when everyone's sat down, they draw a curtain across to separate first class from second class. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably because you always fly first class and we're just going to pray for you through gritted teeth, okay? But um, I, I know what it's like to sit in those second class and we wonder, we wonder what life's like on the other side of the curtain. See, those first class passengers, they're served gourmet food on China plates by a personal attendant. Us lot in second class, we just get those wrapped up plastic type food in those plastic containers, packets of water, I don't know how they do that, and, and something they call nuts. I've never seen bags of nuts so small sold anywhere else except on the plane. And you're never quite sure if it's all okay and safe to eat. The first class passengers have room to stretch out, oh, to stretch out to rest, to kick back, and to sleep. Those of us in second class, we sit together with the proximity that is normally reserved for an engaged couple sitting in the back row of a cinema uh, house watching a film. You know what I'm talking about? Suddenly, you can't help it, but the person you don't know on one side has to become your incredibly good friend at that point. The first class passengers have flight attendants that bring them moist towelettes to just help them to cool down when they feel a little bit hot or just to make sure their personal hygiene is up to spec. Us lot in second class, we just have to put up with our own personal sweat on our faces, left to fend for ourselves. Once that plane takes off, that curtain is drawn and we're left wondering what is on the other side. It's a bit like the Berlin Wall, or dare I say, a bit like the wall, the curtain our partition that separated out the Holy of Places from the Gentile courtyards in the Old Testament. That curtain is a reminder throughout the flight that some people are first class and some aren't. And those who aren't first class, they're not allowed to violate the boundary of that curtain. Anybody ever tried to do that? They're out pretty quick to make sure you get back towards your seat. That curtain tends to stand for exclusivity, exclusion. And as humanity, we tend to divide the world up into us and them. We may not use physical curtains to do that, but our attitudes as Christians can create an us and them mentality. And that's Satan's strategy to divide and rule. Actually, that can happen even inside churches, an us and them mentality. Jesus didn't come to build that. 
And can I say this as a church? We are not here to perpetuate that. Emmanuel is where Jesus is encountered. People are valued. Everybody, everybody, everybody is valued. When Simon Peter was talking with Jesus and Jesus asked the question, who are people saying that I am? And they gave responses. And then he turned to Simon and said, who do you say I am? Simon says to him, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus, little taken back and impressed with Simon's astute reply, he says, blessed are you. Flesh and blood haven't revealed this, but only my father by his spirit has revealed it to you. And he goes on to say these words. He says, now I say to you, Peter, which means rock, upon this rock I will build my... Now the word there, we, we, we use ch church as a building. Jesus is not using that word. It's this Greek word called ecclesia, where we get ecclesiastical from. He says, I'm building my community of people, church. Not a structure, church. My community of vibrant people. My church. And he goes on, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against that. See, Jesus came not to predict a place. He predicted a movement, an ecclesia. That's what we're meant to be. We're not meant to be a place that point to the building where Emmanuel meets and said, that's where things happen. We are meant to be the people that carry the heart, the love and the word of our God to a world that desperately needs to hear authentic, loving Christianity practiced out. Movements are dynamic and flexible and adaptable, and most importantly, they are alive. Monuments are stone-cold, inflexible, uh, inflexible icons that point just to the past. If you read through in Jesus' story not long after that, Jesus actually prays for the unity of his people that is entrusting the future of the church into. He prays some very powerful prayers in John chapter 16 and 17. He's praying that they will be one, even as Jesus is one with the Father. Do you know why Jesus prays for this? Because it is difficult. It is hard to be intentionally loving of, of others around us that aren't necessarily from our set, our community, our culture, our society, our belief system. Our, our whole philosophy. It can be very hard to do that. We can get so hung up on theological peculiarities. Uh, it took a while for me to practice saying that word. How seriously or non-seriously we take the Old Testament. When do we think Jesus is coming back? Is it important to speak in tongues if we're baptised in the Holy Spirit? Is it important to baptise by putting people underwater or we just sprinkle on the top? We can get so hung up about those things that divide us. But do you know what Jesus said? Actually, the thing that brands you as my people is not the belief in those things. They're secondary. In fact, they're even lower than that. The thing that should bind you is love. Jesus said these words, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? By the philosophy that you have. By the theology that you've worked out. By the way that you're holy and pure. By the stance that you have on various New Testament doctrines. No, he didn't say any of that. He says, by the love that you have, for one another and that is an active verb love not some kind of warm fuzzy feeling it's a commitment to love one another that is the real value and he demonstrates that in John chapter 13 at the last supper one of those beautiful acts that Jesus did when the disciples were together at that Passover meal and Jesus then gets up takes a towel and he says he, he, he begins to wash the feet of the disciples they're really uncomfortable with that why because that's an office of a slave and Jesus was modeling a couple of things there when I thought about that. He's modeling first that uh, this is how we show love. And he says, you need to be doing the same for one another. And that is not just about loving Jesus, just submitting himself. He's showing the disciples that actually this job is normally done by one of the lowest slaves in the community. And he's saying, you need to love them like you love me. Elevate their status by the love that you have for them. There are people in our society, we need to elevate their status 
because of our love, our genuine love for them. This unselfish love is critical for us to demonstrate if we're going to be authentic followers of Jesus. Anything less, we're just a religious order. We're just an also ran on moralistic views in this world. Paul kind of teases out those things with some words uh, in his letters. And he uses an interesting phrase. I wonder if you can pick it up. He talks about forgive one another, encourage one another, restore one another, care for one another, submit to one another, carry one another's burdens, bear with one another. What if we just did the one another's? Everybody wants to be one another. Do you understand what I'm saying? Forgive one another. Maybe this week, if you're listening to me right now and you're paying attention, you could take one of these things that I'm going to practice that as a follower of Jesus. Not just somebody else necessarily in the church, just somebody that you know. Encourage one another. Restore somebody. Care for somebody. Submit to somebody. Carry somebody else's burdens. Bear with. Sit with comfort with, come alongside and help one another. That is a powerful message to our world. Our ability to love one another is our megaphone to this world. Actually, it's our megaphone to Lewisham, to the boroughs around us, to London and beyond. It will speak powerfully, will be spoken about. That kind of selfless, non-judgmental, self sacrificial love turned the world upside down in the early church and here's the deal I believe we have the same God the same power and we can do the same thing that the early church did why because God is still committed to his church so right in the center of our purpose purpose statement where Jesus is encountered we have this phrase People are valued. That little phrase, people are valued, is mission critical to all that we do as Emmanuel Gateway Church. It is mission critical. If we don't value people, then everything else is just religion. It doesn't count for an awful lot. Value one another and let that spill out into our community so we become infectious with the love of Jesus. That will transform lives. Bless you. Let's just pray together, shall we, as we conclude right now. And thanks for your attention and just persevering all the way to the end of the things I said. Important to me and I hope you catch my heart in all of that. Our Heavenly Father, we do want to model Jesus in all that we do personally and corporately and as a church at Emmanuel. Lord God, I pray that you would challenge and provoke us to live like Jesus. I pray, God, you would help us to be good at doing all those one another's, not just to people in our community, but people beyond our community, showing respect and care and bearing with and forgiving and just loving like you, Jesus. I pray of our church that, Lord, this will be a place like you were as a person, Jesus, where people come along they find our community and they just want to be here because they sense the power of God flowing out of this place. Lord, I pray your safekeeping over every single person that is listening to these words right now. I speak your grace and your blessing over every single one. And I ask that we will be useful instruments of love in the hands of the Master of Heaven. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Bless you guys. See you very soon. Wow, what a great word. I'm sure you were challenged, you were encouraged, and you were edified and are ready to continue the rest of your week. Thank you, Lord, for that. So we want to continue in this same vein. We want to continue learning, growing. And remember, we have our live connect groups where you can continue in the same fashion. 
So if you're not part of a live group, the email is on the screen. Feel free to get in touch and someone will respond. Well guys, we've uh, almost come to the end, but it doesn't really have to end there. We have Cafe Church now um, with our pastors Nick and Pastor Debbie. Uh, feel free to get your teas, your chocolate, your coffee, whatever it is you're drinking and eating and uh, come join us. The Zoom details are on the screen, so jump on in. Well, that's all from me. We had a great time together, a great time in the presence of the Lord. We'll see you here again next week, same time, and have a great week. God bless you all. Wait a minute. I want to disappear like Tutti disappeared a couple of weeks ago. Let me see if I can... Let me see if it's... Am I still here, Paula? Hold on, one second. Oh, you're going to show me there? No, no.